Welcome to Cocktails in the War Room, everybody. What's going on? Welcome to episode 215 of Cocktails in the War Room. I am your host, Mistress Carrie. Welcome to the War Room. And this is the place that we meet every Tuesday night at 8.30 to talk about everything that's going on, to talk about music. Um, It's something we've been doing since March 14th, believe it or not, of 2020, which is kind of weird when you think about it. Happy New Year, by the way. Um, that now that we're in 2023, this is the fourth calendar year that Cocktails in the War Room has existed. It existed in 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Um, It's kind of strange. Cocktails in the War Room is going to be celebrating, obviously, its anniversary coming up on March 14th. That's the anniversary in 2020 that we started getting together here in the War Room. We got together 80 nights in a row during the very early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then in June of 2020, when we launched the Mistress Carrie podcast, Cocktails in the War Room became a weekly show, which is how we've gotten to 215 episodes. If you're new to Cocktails in the War Room, first of all, welcome. Second of all, let us know in the comments that this is your first time and that uh, you're joining us for the first time in the War Room. Uh, Let us know in the comments also, not only that it's your first time, but also where you're watching from. And if you're new to the War Room or if you're not new to the War Room, um, you hear the whimpering and that's because my co-host is joining us in the War Room as well. My co-host Wednesday, the goth pug, is the Ed McMahon to my Johnny Carson, the peanut butter to my jelly, the Garth to my Wayne, and also the biggest, most spoiled pain in the ass you have ever met down down and she uh gets her own camera that's the pug cam and uh she hangs out with us as long as the cookies last that are in my pocket and then she takes off until it's time for mail call later can you get down please good girl good girl back up and show everybody how cute you are good girl what's up mark keith is here tracy frank melissa elsa uh michael's here trina butch first time from auburn Nicely done, Butch. Welcome to the War Room. Allow the War Room family, as they have named themselves, to welcome you properly. This is where we hang out every Tuesday night at 8.30, and we talk about everything that's going on, especially uh, music. Jay says, greetings from next door to Fort Hood. Jay, thank you for hanging out with us in the War Room. Um, This has become a place where we can come and joke around and make light of how terrible the world can be sometimes and also rally around each other when things get hard and you're looking for support. And what's amazing about this War Room family is that the longer that we get together, the more time we spend together, um, friendships have been made through the War Room, both near and far. People have become friends with people they've never met across the U.S. People have begun traveling now to go and visit war room members. Um, and then the ones that live in the, the same vicinity have started to congregate, to go to concerts together, to meet each other at VFWs, to uh, volunteer for charitable organizations together. And every once in a while, we all get together. And I can tell you that if plans go the way that I'm hoping, and if you have a Mistress Carrie backstage pass, you already heard me talk about this on Sunday night, or Monday night, excuse me, that um, we are going to start working on plans to start getting together um, soon. Um, This should shut Keith up for a while, Um, but also on the possibility of uh, on a regular basis as well, which would be great. So that was always in the plans once we decided that Cocktails in the War Room was something that was going to stick around. But as you'll remember, if you've been here from the beginning, if you're OG War Room family, um, this was just a way for us to kind of talk about what was going on back in 2020, shortly after WAF was sold, shortly after the pandemic began, and nobody was really understanding what was going on in the world. And so we all just started getting together. Originally, it was just with my cell phone. Then we decided to up the production value with lights and now with multiple cameras and so much other stuff. Um, And Wednesday, that's not nice. Back up. High five. If you're going to get cookies, can I have a paw? Other paw. Thank you. Down. Good girl. Um, So this has kind of been our way of staying connected, even when it wasn't possible to get connected in person. 
And now that the world is opening back up, albeit slowly, uh, to find creative ways to not only get us all together, but to galvanize this manpower and the and the passion of the members of the war room to be able to go and do good things, not only uh, charity and nonprofit wise, but also to be able to get out and have a little fun every now and again, because uh, we need that too. Jessica says Wednesday is so adorable. She's also spoiled and she likes to whine a lot. And by the way, if you're new to the war room, um, these are our uh, Instagram handles. So obviously, you know what mine is. Wednesdays is at Wednesday, the goth pug, and uh, she's doing quite well with followers of her own. So if you have Instagram, make sure you give her a follow. She likes to post her own content and it's all in her own voice. And uh, there's some pretty adorable pictures of her up there as well. Uh, Let's see. Lisa says, happy new year. Have, um, have you come to see any of us? Says Melissa, Uh, Melissa, we're trying and you know, we're trying. But there's a lot of moving parts, not only to the show, um, but also just to all things Mistress Carrie, whether it be the radio shows, whether it be the podcast, the war room, the website, the online store. Um, Heaven forbid I not give attention to this furry little nugget over here and I hear about it. Uh, 2023, I am digital man horse, says Keith. Aloha, MC. Happy New Year. Jim, are you joining us from Hawaii? Um, I did want to tell you guys a little bit about what happened in Hawaii over the weekend, actually. Thanks for the reminder, Jim. Um, That Alice Cooper's longtime manager, uh, Shep Gordon, who uh, permanently resides in Hawaii. Uh, There's a fantastic documentary about him, by the way, about just what an amazing guy he is. Uh, I think it's called The Mensch, I believe. Um, He has a charity concert to help raise money for the food banks in Hawaii every year. And uh, this past weekend, Sammy Hagar, Mick Fleetwood, Richie Sambora from Bon Jovi, Alice Cooper, uh, members of Train, I think it's Pat Moynihan was there. There was just a ton of artists. They raised over a million dollars in one night at this charity event, and they were able to fund the food banks in Hawaii for an entire year based off of that concert um, on one night in Hawaii. And there's some great video of, of all of those guys kind of up on stage jamming together, which is really cool. So, um, Mark wants to know, can we toast Rocco? Well, Mark, uh, it's actually ozone that passed recently. Rocco passed years ago, but obviously we can toast both of those guys. And it is something that I did want to address right off the bat because, um, if you, uh, found me or the Mistress Carrie podcast or Cocktails in the War Room because it's online and you're a lover of music, you may or may not be aware that um, you've heard me talking about it, obviously, my former radio station, WAF, that was sold back in February of 2020. And anybody that worked there for any amount of time um, was part of something extremely special. It's what we talked about the week leading up to the station going off the air, There are people like Mike Chu and I that were there for decades that have remained incredibly close. There are other people that worked there that once they left and finished their tenure there and continued on with their careers, uh, may have kept in touch with people they used to work with, may not. Um, But if you spent any amount of time at WAF, it's this badge of honor. You're part of this exclusive club. There's no more cookies Wednesday. Um. And you're always going to have that that badge on you, for better or worse. And John Osterlind was someone that um, was part of WAF for a good long while. Um, he uh, grew up in Connecticut, had done radio in Rhode Island in Connecticut, and was someone that was kind of always there that I remember Um, I started my internship in 91 and shortly after, I believe, uh, John Osterlin joined the air staff and, um, he was the midday host. He was also the music director through a lot of incredibly prolific years in rock and roll the the mid nineties, the shift from the hair bands to grunge. And then the shift from grunge into the new metal mid to late nineties era, um, John Osterlin had a lot of nicknames, the ozone, um, slap meat. Uh, there was just, there are so many names that he had and, um, 
he was somebody that was always so fun to be around that, uh, albeit having poor taste in football teams, because he was a diehard Cowboys fan, he was somebody that was always inviting people to his house to watch football games on Sunday, was somebody that was always up for a party, was someone that was just incredibly gracious to everyone from the interns to the bosses. When I uh, started as an intern, when I became a member of the street team, when I was welcomed by John as a full-time member of the air staff, he was just always there to kind of uh, giggle about stuff, not take things too personally, but also to offer encouragement when needed, to make introductions as the music director. He had close relationships with a lot of artists, record labels, band managers, agents, and was always someone, especially when I took over as the music director, I believe in 2005, um, that John was always somebody that was like, oh, do you know Carrie? And um, so uh, late night on New Year's Eve, I received word via text message that there were reports that he had passed away and he had been living in Louisiana and New Orleans for a while doing radio down there. And we had always kept in touch. We were friends on Facebook and messaged each other from time to time. And then obviously when WAF got sold and was coming off the air, he was one of the DJs that we sought out to be part of the sign off and to be part of um, the final broadcast because he was such an integral part of the radio station's legacy. And um, so I didn't want to comment on it New Year's Eve because I was kind of waiting for some kind of official confirmation. We've all seen reports of people where there have been, um, you know, social media online reports that someone had passed away only to find out that that was not the case. And um, then everyone's kind of backpedaling. And especially with someone that I know personally, I wanted to make sure that it was true. And uh, when I found out on New Year's Day that it was true, um, it was heartbreaking. Hey, shush. Because... I think everyone that's ever worked at WAF has kind of held out hope, and obviously COVID made it incredibly difficult, um, that we would always get back together in some way, shape, or form, that we would have some kind of big, glorious reunion, and, um, you know, people would fly in, and we'd be able to get together and maybe generate some hilarious social media content. Um, you know, people have asked about making a documentary on the 50 year legacy of the radio station. And I think it's just one of those things. John was only 55 years old. And so the idea that, you know, if anything like that happens in the future, which would be amazing that it would not include John, um, is incredibly sad. We lost Rocco some years back. Um, he was someone that a lot of people lost touch with. Obviously, it's a lot easier to keep in touch with people now. Uh, Social media has made that a lot easier. Before, it was like you were sending letters and phone calls um, and email after a while. But it's gotten so much easier to kind of keep tabs on people, especially people that continue on in the industry because they've got professional profiles on social media. So it's very easy to kind of keep tabs on these people and see what they're doing on their shows and see where they're living now and keep up with their families. And, um, and so now, uh, I was just talking to, uh, Craig Seaman from the, uh, Worcester Telegram today about, you know, some of the, uh, WAF, um, CDs, the charitable CDs that had come out. And we were talking about the one that came out in 2000 that was the survive this CD. And it's got, you know, Greg Hill and Kevin Barbary and Mike Shu and Lyndon Byers and John Osterland and Rocco and Birdsey and me. And now to have Rocco and John Osterland from that one photo not be here with us anymore um, is kind of devastating. And it was really hard to find someone that didn't love John. Uh, the messages that uh, I've been getting from people that worked for record labels, people that worked with him professionally, but not in a radio sense. Uh, People that worked with bands that had come through that either had performed on the Ozone Cafe or um, that, you know, just knew John from trying to break bands in Boston. And more often than not, those bands were getting broken on WAF. People that hadn't seen John in decades, 
but just remember him so fondly. Um, it, uh, it's just difficult. Um, Brian commenting RIP ozone and Rebecca. So if you, uh, hadn't kept in touch with ozone over the last some years, um, he had become very transparent about his personal life, um, and had dueling, um, Facebook pages because John was very open about it. I'm not talking out of school or giving up personal secrets, um, that he, uh, had begun to transition to a woman, uh, the woman that he always believed that he was. And, um, a lot of the interviews that he had been doing over the last couple of years, he talked very candidly about how that transition wasn't easy for him, that he had always, um, dated women and loved women and that, uh, he was finding it difficult to be in relationships with women because he was trying to live as his true self or as her true self. And, um, that was a part of John's life and why I keep referring to him as John is that I knew about Rebecca, but never really knew Rebecca. And John was never someone that when he decided to uh, really start living as his true self, as her true self, that um, insisted that people call him Rebecca, that we still called him John, we still talked about him and that was something that he was fully comfortable with and and was okay with at least the last time that I spoke to him, which obviously was now a couple of years ago. And um, it just is, hey, it's just something that, um, you know, for people that, that weren't around him all the time, like I said, he had been living in New Orleans for some years now. And so a lot of us only kept in touch with him via social media and hadn't really seen him lately. And he was still out as John as well, and then was out as Rebecca, almost like they were two completely separate people. Um, it's just incredibly hard for a lot of people to um, understand now that, you know, any kind of reconciliation, any kind of reunions, any kind of opportunity to get back together, whether it be you traveling through New Orleans, you know, John has always had always said, Hey, if you ever come down to New Orleans, let me know. And I'll take you out to some cool spots. Um, and I never had the chance to do that. And he had come, uh, back to, uh, WAF once, uh, because there was some talk about possibly bringing him back in some capacity, um, and that was in like the final year of kind of the reconstruction and then the eventual sale of WAF. And I didn't get to see him because he was kind of brought in under the cloak of darkness that they didn't want anybody to know that he was coming to town for meetings. Uh, and I had texted him and was like, you came into town and you didn't call me, you bastard. And um, so, you know, I, I don't really know what else to say. A lot of people have been asking um, both by email and social media, uh, both on the radio and here in the war room to ask me to respond to the news. And, you know, I can't say that I was, you know, one of his best friends. I can't say that we were incredibly close, especially in the last few years. But what I can say is that I respected him as a mentor, that I believe he respected me as a coworker, that he is someone that I had the utmost respect for his talent and um, his graciousness, his sense of humor. Um, there was always a humbleness about John where it was almost like he was uncomfortable with the notoriety. There's a lot of stories coming out about John now, um, you know, that I had forgotten. I forgot that he got arrested after one of the indoor beach parties in Lowell. Uh, in a hotel with a bunch of listeners partying in the middle of the night and he had gotten arrested. I remember it now, but it was one of those things until someone brought it up. I had totally forgotten that that happened. He was always someone that was looking for the party. And if you ever partied with him, um, you know that he was always one that was just ready to have a good time and crack jokes. And um, he's going to be missed. And for the people that knew Rebecca... Uh, she will be missed as well. And, um, 
you know, it's, I'm just, the world is a little less funny. And I know that uh, for all of the members of the WAF family, um, you know, John is, is someone we always loved. And, uh, you know, I haven't heard anyone comment on anything on social media since the reports of his passing were uh, announced saying that he wasn't a good person, that he wasn't funny, that he wasn't gracious to people. And I think that's the mark of someone's legacy is that when people have to really think hard and still can't come up with something negative to say about you, it's pretty spectacular. So, um, so that's what I wanted to say about, uh, about ozone. Uh, Eric wanted to know what I did on new. Oh, so first of all, uh, people asking not only to toast Rocco, but obviously to toast John Osterland as well. So the, um, Fernandez sangria mug has returned so cheers to Ozone, cheers to Rocco. Thanks to everyone that uh, has been sending just amazing stories and memories of Ozone and the fact that um, he was part of so many people's lives, I think is a testament to how talented he was. So yeah, Mohawk Dave, she is totally attacking the pillows here in the war room. And now that she had her little burst of energy, she's completely passed out and asleep over there on the couch. Um, Eric asked what I had done for New Year's. So the last couple of years um, sucked because um, I wasn't able to be with my husband because he was deployed. This year, um, my wolf pack, as we call ourselves, uh, my husband and the kids were all together for New Year's here. And so we opted to kind of have our own little New Year's party. So um, we made homemade tacos uh, we watched movies, uh, we watched the new Top Gun movie, uh, I made homemade soft pretzels, we had ice cream floats, and then at midnight we set off a bunch of those, you know, pole crackers, wore funny hats, hugged and kissed each other, and wished, wished each other a happy new year, and um, I've never been one to really go out very often um, to any kind of big public thing on New Year's, I always kind of looked at it like amateur night a little bit. Um, I do enjoy a good house party, um, but it's always something that, I, you know, just being on the roads late night on New Year's is just always something that kind of weirds me out a little bit because so many people push it past the limit and get in a car. Um, we've had years where the weather has been incredibly dangerous. And so being able to spend, um, you know, kind of a quiet New Year's at home with my family that we haven't been able to do for the last few years because of my husband's deployment uh, was pretty special and spectacular. And we had a really good time. The pretzels came out great. Um, I have a recipe that is kind of a mock-up of uh, the pretzels you get at the mall. And they're really, really good. And so they were begging me to make homemade pretzels, which I did. And uh, Melissa says, you need to adopt me into your family. Um, Heidi says, yummy. Sounds like an incredible New Year's. Family makes everything better. It was nice to be able to get a kiss at midnight, um, and it was the first time since my husband and I got married that we were able to kiss at midnight because he spent the last two New Year's overseas um, since we got married, so that was kind of nice that we all got to spend it together. So uh, Jen said, we stayed home. Best way to spend it, exactly. Jessica says, that sounds amazing. Uh, Jonathan says, if you have Paramount, it's free. Yeah. Talking about the Top Gun movie. Um, let's see, uh, da, da, da. share the recipe says Shannon. Uh, I have no problem sharing the recipe. And you know, what's really funny is that Lizzie Hale, matter of fact, I checked out her recipe and it's actually really, really good. Very close to mine. If you guys go on Lizzie Hale's Twitter feed, um, she actually tweeted out on New Year's her recipe for soft pretzels. Hers includes beer. Mine does not. I believe that was basically the only difference. Um, but uh, she made homemade soft pretzels on New Year's as well, which I thought was kind of hilarious. So if you're looking for a great soft pretzel recipe, go to Lizzie Hale's Twitter feed, look up her tweets from New Year's, and you'll see the recipe that she put up um, for her soft pretzels. And they're really, really good. Um, uh, Keith said, uh, brought my, uh, son to his favorite hibachi restaurant. 
Matter of fact, that's something that we also did um, leading up to New Year's is that the kids wanted to go out for uh, hibachi and we did that with some friends as well. Uh, we went to the place down at Patriot Place and then we walked around and checked out all the lights and then across Route 1 from Patriot Place, they had one of those drive through like Christmas light display things and so we ended up going to do that one. You guys had been sending suggestions to a bunch of different places. They had like their own... Um, FM radio signal that was playing Christmas music. And so we went and did that. And that was really cool as well. So our gang of friends uh, all stay over at one person's house for a couple of days. Kim, that sounds fantastic. And I've done that as well. And I always thought it was great that a bunch of either couples or just a bunch of friends rent a house somewhere and go and kind of spend New Year's as like a two or three day thing. And I've done that in the past and it's awesome. Um, you know, obviously if you're not a skier, it's expensive to go to a place that's close to any kind of ski mountain or whatever. But if you're looking for a place to go and just kind of get everybody together, especially a central location, if you've got friends and family from around the country to meet somewhere and kind of everybody go grocery shopping and a place that's got a hot tub or a swimming pool and just to spend a few days together, it's awesome. And if everybody chips in, it's actually not that expensive. Um, really, really fun. Rachel just put up the link in the comments to Lizzie's pretzel recipe. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and I was actually analyzing Lizzie's uh, recipe. Like I said, Lizzie's includes beer. Mine doesn't, but other than that, it looks pretty damn close. Um, Hers, when you uh, brush them with melted butter and you put like co uh, coarse, kosher, coarse kosher salt on them, I like to put garlic salt on mine. And also this year I tried some of that um, everything but the bagel seasoning, which was also fantastic. So, um, but you can also do um, the butter with cinnamon and sugar. You can cut out some of the dough and mix some garlic in there so that there's garlic kind of inside the pretzels. There's a lot that you can do once you get the dough made, um, but so good, so good. Uh, so that's what I did on New Year's. And now it is, um, you know, today's the first business day of the new year. So I spent a lot of time today uh, working on lining up interviews for the year. Uh, there's a lot of news about the podcast that I want to share with you guys um, so yeah, there's a lot of great stuff going on. All right. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to talk about cocktails. And, um, as I was looking for a cocktail recipe, which by the way, if you're new to the war room, this is something we do every week. I have a bunch of cocktail books that I have here at the bar in the war room, which I don't think I explained the war room to the people that are new, but this is the room in my house where all of my military memorabilia is all of, um, the photos of my family who have served in the military and all of the things I've brought back from my trips overseas. And it's also where the bar is, which is why we started uh, choosing to meet here in the war room and why this room's been called the war room for the last 12 years since I've had the house. So every week we grab one of the cocktail books out of the war room and go through some cocktail recipes. Um, this I thought was interesting. Um, because I thought it might be a little tropical now that we've kind of gotten through the new year and the holidays and we're getting into the coldest part of the year for a lot of people in the country that you might be looking for something to kind of, um, you know, be a little tropical. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, have like indoor luau parties in like the height of the winter, uh, especially if you're going to be going for like an apres ski thing. I know a lot of people rent vacation houses in the wintertime and, um, you know, get hot tubs and go out and lay in the snow in bikinis. Or if you're deciding to go someplace tropical, uh, as a vacation in January or February to get away from the cold, this is called the Coconilla Delight. It's an ounce of gold rum, a peeled banana, an ounce of coconut cream, three ounces of pineapple juice, three ounces of fresh orange juice, and two scoops of vanilla ice cream. And it says, blend the ingredients with crushed ice, pour into a highball glass, and serve with a straw. Now, obviously, you're blending the banana into the drink with the rum, the pineapple juice, the orange juice, the coconut cream. 
Um, my suggestion, because we're always talking about garnishing our cocktails here in the war room as well, the Bloody Mary should not corner the market on garnishes. Um, I thought that maybe you could cut some banana slices, dip them in chocolate and freeze them, put them on a skewer and put those in the drink. I thought that would be really good. Obviously there's pineapple juice and orange juice in this recipe. So pineapple uh, pieces and orange wedges as part of that garnish as well, I thought would be delicious. You could also um, chocolate cover uh, oranges and pineapples as well, fresh pieces. Uh, Put those in the freezer, float them on top to keep the drink cold. Um, Maybe drizzle it with a little chocolate syrup if you really want to get crazy. Um, And I also thought because it's got coconut cream in it, that you could also find a creative way to garnish it with a coconut macaroon. I'm just saying, we're all about the garnishes. Um, uh, you had me at ice cream, says Mark. Graham cracker crumb rim. Donna, chef's kiss to you. Those are the kinds of ideas that we are always looking for when it comes to... Um, garnishing our cocktails a hundred percent that would be so good oh crushed nilla wafers on the rim yes even just a nilla wafer on top or just the crumbs because this is going to be a thicker drink because of the ice cream and the crushed ice that's blended in so even just kind of drizzling the crumbs to the graham crackers or the nilla wafers or both on the top would be um spectacular. So that's called the Coconilla Delight. And uh, just to recap, gold rum, a peeled banana, coconut cream, pineapple juice, fresh orange juice, vanilla ice cream, blended with crushed ice and served in a highball glass with a straw. And obviously, because you're fancy, um, a maraschino cherry or 10, because you guys know how much I love a maraschino cherry. So I thought that sounded really, really good. All right. Want to remind you guys about some upcoming events now that it's officially 2023 as we start um, hunkering down for the winter and hoping for spring. One of the marks that spring has arrived is going to be the big gig at the DCU Center in Worcester. That's happening April 29th. And it's going to feature Breaking Benjamin, Falling in Reverse, The Pretty Reckless, Beartooth, and Dorothy. And tickets are on sale now. The details are on the events calendar at mistresscarry.com. All right, let's talk podcast, shall we? And by the way, there's more events coming up. Um, the last episode of 2022 featured Luke Spiller from The Struts, who ended up ringing in the new year on Fremont Street in Vegas with Bush And if you are not familiar with the struts, you may remember Luke Spiller. He fronted Queen at Wembley on stage at the Taylor Hawkins tribute show earlier uh, in 2020, which is something he went into detail about in this week's episode or last week's episode, I should say, talking about growing up loving Queen, talking about how humbled he was to be asked to participate in the show. And um, the struts were one of the newer bands that was asked to um, be part of the tribute to Taylor Hawkins. And it was because Taylor Hawkins was such a huge fan of the struts. Uh, Luke talked about being invited to front queen and that Brian may sir, Dr. Uh, Brian Harold may, whatever we want to call him. Congratulations to Brian may from queen who, uh, was knighted by King Charles and, uh, had responded to the news that he was being knighted on his Instagram that Brian May had asked Luke to kind of walk with the band to the stage, that famous queen walk to the stage uh, at Wembley that had been done at Live Aid with Freddie Mercury and then once again at the Freddie Mercury tribute concert some years later. And he shared a lot of memories about his time with the Struts touring with the Foo Fighters and his memories of Taylor Hawkins. And we also just talked a lot about the state of rock and roll Um, about touring, about inspiration. Um, The Struts is a band that I really feel like embodies the true spirit of rock and roll. It's a little glam. It's a little dancey. It's a little dirty. Uh, The songs are definite party songs. Um, You know, a band like Buck Cherry, a band like The Struts, these bands that you just think are are going to be so fun. Like I want to have a keg party in my backyard in the summertime and have the struts play it because everyone would have an absolute blast at it. 
And uh, he's a fantastic interview. Um, he's super fun. He's very candid, open, honest, um, just an amazing guy. Talked a lot about his kind of sheltered childhood growing up um, in a very Christian household, in a home that was surrounded by uh, Christian music only. And he talked about the kind of process of discovering rock and roll kind of on his own terms as he got older. And then what um, kind of uh, inspired him to um, become a musician and a songwriter himself. So if you do not know the struts, uh, I encourage you to go and not only listen to this episode, check out the music in the um, playlist that goes with this episode, and also go and check out some of their live performances. Definitely go and check out the performance at Wembley at the Taylor Hawkins Tribute if you haven't seen it. I'm sure there's a YouTube video of it somewhere. Um, but uh, I met these guys back in late 2015, early 2016. They played um, uh, in Boston on their first U.S. tour. And at the time, I was the music director at WAF, and the record company said, you really need to go and see this band. We really want to hear what you have to say, but we also feel like this band is going to be huge, and you're going to want to be able to say that you saw them um, uh, in a club. And I saw them at Sinclair in Harvard Square in front of maybe 75 to 100 people. I think that venue holds three to 400. And they played like they were playing Wembley themselves. And I spent a lot of time with them backstage after the show, just getting to know them. And I said it to them in the interview, you know, we talked that night for a while and they kind of talked about their dreams and aspirations and how exciting it was for them to play their first ever show, you know, tour in the United States. And all of the things that they talked about back then, what, eight years ago, nine years ago, um, they've kind of already done. And he was very quick to say, but we have a long way to go. We have a lot more things we want to accomplish. Um, so, uh, definitely go and check out, this is the final episode of 2022, episode 134 of the Mistress Carrie podcast featuring Luke Spiller from the Struts. And to start 2023, uh, I wanted to do this interview for a few reasons. One, because, uh, this person is a fellow member of the Pantheon podcast network. But if you listen to the podcast every week, I've talked to so many people that are authors that have written their own life story. Um, you know, we talked to Geezer Butler about what it was like for him to finish the first draft of his upcoming autobiography. Um, we've talked to so many different people about uh, telling their stories in book form, and uh, including Frank Bello from Anthrax. And my guest this week has done it 115 times. Not only is he a podcast host, but he is also a published author who has a new book coming out on Valentine's Day. So episode 135 of the Mistress Carrie podcast is author and podcast host Martin Popoff. Now, Martin Popoff hosts the podcast on the Pantheon Podcast Network called History in Five Songs. Every episode, he kind of finds a theme and then finds five songs to kind of prove that point that he's trying to make. And he is a true definition of a musicologist. And coming up on Valentine's Day, he has a new book coming out. It is called Pink Floyd and the Dark Side of the Moon, 50 Years. Dark Side of the Moon is celebrating its 50th anniversary coming up in March. This book is coming out in February. This is an actual copy of the book. It hasn't come out yet. It's available for pre-order everywhere you buy your books. This is the hardcover version. It comes in the kaleidoscope frame. So if you are, excuse me, I'll do that. If you are a Pink Floyd fan, if you are a fan of just books about uh, seminal albums, about artists, uh, this book uh, is beautifully done. Um, I want to read you the description of the book first. It says, take a deep dive into one of the best-selling albums ever. Martin Popoff leaves no stone unturned in examining Pink Floyd's generation-spanning masterpiece while exploring all 10 songs and their themes of madness, anxiety, and alienation. Popoff also tackles Pink Floyd pre-Dark Side, including ex-member and co-founder Sid Barrett, the recording session at famed Abbey Road, studio gear, and more. 
Song by song studies of each album side analyze lyrics, song structures, and instruments used by David Gilmore, Roger Waters, Nick Mason, and Richard Wright. Popoff even looks at the album's art and packaging, supporting tours and rock, the rock group's um, trajectory post Dark Side, including a brief discography, tour dates, and sidebars covering the band members, session players, collectibles, and more. Pink Floyd and Dark Side of the Moon is illustrated with performance and offstage photography, as well as rare memorabilia, and the result is a richly presented tribute to a rock masterpiece. Hello, Wednesday. It's not time for a mail call yet. She's right here. It's not time. Did you have a nice little nap? Hmm? Did you have a nice little nap? So I wanted to show you the book a little bit. Uh, it's available for pre-order. Like I said, it comes out in February. Um, it's a beautifully put together book. Really nice hardcover, uh, glossy photos. And literally takes a deep dive into album cover artwork, uh, each song. There's sidebars about all kinds of different stuff. There's a lot of um, uh, studio stuff. He gets into um, a lot of the gear that was used in the studio in the recording of the album. And um, he's just a really, really interesting guy. He Here's... Uh, Picture the studio at Abbey Road Studios, which, by the way, um, there's a new documentary out on Disney Plus called If These Walls Could Sing that is put together by Mary McCartney, who's Paul McCartney's daughter. And uh, it's a documentary about Abbey Road Studios and about all of the amazing music that was made in that studio, including Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. And actually, David Gilmore and Roger Waters separately, of course, um, give interviews in that documentary. And we touched a little bit about the documentary in this episode as well. But, um, there are, uh, you know, there's, there's, it was, sorry, uh, illustrated comics. Um, if you are a, um, Pink Floyd fan, I think this is a must have book. Um, if you got an Amazon gift card, I just want you to see what she's doing. If you got an Amazon gift card or something, they are selling the book on Amazon. If you have somebody that's a Pink Floyd fan that has a birthday coming up, um, I think this would be a spectacular gift, especially for anyone that um, loves this record. Uh, and he did do a whole sidebar on what I asked Nick Mason about, which is the correlation between um, Dark Side of the Moon and The Wizard of Oz as well. And there's a deep dive into that in the book. So this is episode 135 of the Mistress Carrie podcast, and it features author and podcast host um, Martin Popoff. And uh, we got a little nerdy. I'm not going to lie. We got a little nerdy when it came to some rock stuff. Um, he and I had some differences of opinions when it comes to... Um, kind of the role of podcasts. We talked a lot about whether or not people that listen to podcasts want music incorporated into those podcasts, because it is a question that is being debated right now with all of the music licensing firms. And we've talked about it here in the war room about the eventuality of people like me being able to use songs in my podcast, uh, either full songs, um, you know, more than I think the, I think the limit is like 10 to 15 seconds of songs that you can use now. So if you were, you know, having a discussion about a guitar solo, you could play part of the guitar solo in a podcast without kind of getting into trouble. Um, but um, we had a conversation about that, about what people uh, want from podcast listening, about the future of the music industry. Uh, if you guys are speculating what the book costs, it depends on where. If you just Google the book, you're going to find a bunch of different online retailers that have it, Amazon being one. Um, I think Amazon's selling it pre-sale for like 50 bucks. I saw it in another place for like $42, but uh, it's going to be right around 50 bucks or so. So you will you can definitely find it and then it'll ship um, when it comes out on Valentine's Day. But um it's really well done. It's really well put together. A, a lot of hard work came into this. And he even jokes on the podcast about now that he um, 
has done this book. He had to listen to the album so many times that uh, he never wants to listen to it again. <laughs> Seriously, guys. Yeah. Uh, the documentary is awesome, Brett says. I have not watched it yet, but it is on my list um, to watch like in the next couple of weeks. It's not something that I thought the Wolf Pack was going to enjoy while they were here. So it was something that I thought I was going to like pop some popcorn and spend some quality time nerding out about music, watching uh, If These Walls Could Sing, the uh, documentary about Abbey Road. So uh, I am nerdy and I'm immediately on board. Uh, she is patiently waiting for mail calls, says Donna. Wednesday is using the pillow instead of throwing them. That's what she does a lot. Props her little head on a little pillow. When she sleeps with me at night, um, she has her own pillow um, on her side of the bed. And then I always wake up and she has her head on my pillow and she's like all snuggled up. And uh, sometimes she opts not to sleep with me. She has her own bed in a crate in my room. And sometimes she puts herself to bed if I stay up too late uh, more often than not, she wants to uh, get into bed with me, but so you're slowly making little snuggle adjustments into that pillow. Seriously, I can't even handle it. She is tired, Tracy. I told you, she ran around, attacked the pillows for like 30 seconds, and now she needs, this is her second nap of the show. The show hasn't even been on for an hour, and she's already napped twice. Jessica says she's not spoiled. She's a trained cutie. Yeah, exactly. Um, she's getting old in her young age, says Melissa. All right, so that is um, episode 135 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. It is out at midnight. And the podcast, um, if you subscribe and follow the Mistress Carrie podcast, not only do you get all of the weekly episodes, but you also get the sit rep, which you get Monday through Friday. And the sit rep came out every day through the holidays. The only time the sit rep takes a break is if I'm traveling because it's just too hard for me to try and produce them while I'm traveling. And it's not something, obviously, because it's up-to-date uh, music and entertainment news, that it's not something I can really produce ahead of time. It's something that has to be done uh, day in and day out in order for all of the news and the headlines to be um, to be newsworthy. So uh, every week you get the full-length episodes, you get the sit reps, and if you want to listen to the Mistress Carrie podcast, um, it's growing every day. These are just some of the many outlets that you can listen to the podcast on. Um, it's a member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Um, there's, I think it's like 150 podcasts, including Martin Popoff's podcast as well. Um, and you can also listen at mistresscarry.com. And uh, the plan is to expand the, the podcast and to um, be able to... Um, uh, start putting the podcast in more places and to really start doing more with the podcast in 2023. So I've got a lot of plans this year, um, but this is just some of the places and all of these links are at mistresscarry.com. There's also embedded players. So if you're not podcast savvy, you can just go to mistresscarry.com, find the episode and just click play on the player. Um, if you have a Mistress Carry backstage pass, we met up last night and you already know this, but I wanted to let you know that not only did we finish up the year uh, with the podcast listened to in 139 countries, but uh, we finally ran the metrics on the year as a whole. Now, you'll remember that the Mistress Carrie podcast debuted midway through 2020. That's why Cocktails in the War Room became a weekly show instead of a daily show because we started producing the podcast. So we only had a half a year's metrics for 2020. 2021, uh, the podcast grew exponentially. Um, and now in 2022, over 2021, we were up 20, uh, no, excuse me, 32% last year over 2021. And I believe 2021, we were up like 22% or something like that. And we were up 19% um, in 2021 over 2020. So, like, the numbers are just growing exponentially to be up 32% overall year to year 
from, because 2021 was the first full year, um, 2022, the second full year, and to be up 32% from 2021, uh, this is you guys. This is you guys um, sharing the podcast. This is you guys commenting the five-star reviews. A few weeks ago, we got the wrapped from Spotify, um, and that was just all of the stats from Spotify. This is all of the stats from every single podcast outlet that there is. Um, people that listen on the website, this is all of the listening averaged out to 32% growth for the year and in 139 countries. And it is um, mind boggling. So uh, pretty unbelievable. So uh, I see someone asking um, if there are updates about Damar. And this is um, something that I wanted to address actually before we get into all of the music news and mail call. Um, Obviously, anybody watching Monday Night Football last night saw what happened. It's been all over the news in the last 24 hours. Um, People speculating. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about uh, what's happened. They did come out with an official diagnosis, and it was what a lot of doctors had speculated. If you'll remember, um, a few years back, there was a um, a rash of uh, lacrosse players and baseball players that had... um, been either hit by a ball to the chest or had taken a helmet to the chest. And I don't know what it's called. Somebody that knows, can you please put it up in the comments? But basically in the electric rhythm of your heart, there is a point where you are the most vulnerable for a direct hit to the chest. And it's a very slim window. You've got to be hit in the exact right space at the exact right time. And if that happens, it disrupts the electrical impulses in your heart's rhythm. And there was a lot of speculation that that is what happened to Damar last night. And now they've come out and said that that is in fact what happened. There were a lot of people commenting that it was because he was vaccinated, which I don't even know if he was vaccinated or not. I'm assuming that he was, um, but that's not what happened at all. And what happened is a lot of baseball players, both minor league, major league, college players, started wearing like an underarm t-shirt underneath that has a diamond-shaped pad right over the center of your chest so that if you took a ball to the chest, that um, the likelihood of this happening to you um, uh, would go down. And a lot of lacrosse players wear this kind of shirt. It's not quite a chest protector like what a catcher wears, but it's a centrally located padding that is bendable that just protects that incredibly sensitive part of your chest in case, oh, here we go. Um, uh, Commodio cordis, Rachel, am I pronouncing that correctly? You can Google it. You can look it up. Actually, Opie, former coworker, um, of mine from WAF actually uh, tweeted out last night a video of a doctor that was explaining, this is before the diagnosis was confirmed, this is what he thought it was. And he explained exactly how it happens and why it happens and where in the heart's rhythm the strike to the chest had to take place in order for it to put you into cardiac arrest. Um, now, reports have come out from a family spokesperson that not only was he revived by CPR on the field, if you remember from last night, if you were watching Monday Night Football, he was on the field for nine minutes while people were trying to revive him um, before he was transported by ambulance to the hospital. He was revived a second time at the hospital as well. And um, so there's a couple things I wanted to talk about. First of all, uh, somebody mentioning it about the GoFundMe, um, Damar from, uh, and I'm not familiar with him. I'm not a Bills fan. So I've heard his name, but, um, I'm a Pats fan. So I don't know everything about, you know, DeMar's history and his upbringing. And, um, but everyone has come out and just talked about what an exemplary human being he is, uh, what a great player he is, what a family man he is. There's footage of him hugging his mom before the start of the game. They were able to get his mom out of the stands and into the ambulance with him. And she traveled to the hospital with him last night. And one of the things that he had done is he had started a toy drive um, and he had set the modest goal of like $2,500. People have been donating to this toy drive and it's raised over $5 million 
in 24 hours because people feel powerless and helpless and they want to do something. And I think it's spectacular and beautiful that it, it if you go through the donations, um, it seems like every player in the NFL has donated $1,000. And you just go through every team in the NFL has changed all of their social media profile pictures to this, which I think is amazing as well. Um, they obviously suspended the game, did not continue the play against um, the Bengals last night. The league came out today and said that they don't know when or if the game is going to be made up. There's no word, obviously, because this is unprecedented on how the season is going to continue, how the playoff, like nobody's really focusing on that. But unfortunately for somebody at the NFL, that's their job is to kind of figure out what to do um, if and when football returns for the rest of the season and obviously doing it in a tactful manner, obviously doing it in a respectful manner. Skip Bayless uh, tweeted out some stuff and is just getting raked over the coals for what he said on social media last night. So, um, um, you know, it's unprecedented. The other thing that I wanted to talk about because of this, because it was revived on the field by CPR, obviously revived at the hospital again by doctors and trained medical professionals. But it's one of the first things that I thought. It's something that my old company used to do and that members of the staff used to do. I implore you that if you own a company to put this practice in place, and if you work for a company, especially in any kind of managerial role, but even if you're just an employee at a company, to go to the managers and ask, could they bring in a CPR instructor? And could they, on company time, offer to certify employees in CPR? Now, it wasn't made mandatory at my old company, but it was something where you were given the time, on company time, to um, learn CPR and get certified. And their hope was that uh, if enough employees did that, that no matter the company event, no matter the time of day or night within the building, that if an emergency took place, that there would be someone trained to be able to handle it, meaning CPR and using the, um, the, uh, uh, the paddles that were in the, the wall thing that they had installed that people would be able to help save their coworkers until paramedics and emergency crews would be able to get there. And it's something that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about since then, but if it wasn't for the quick acting of the people that were there, whether it be the team doctors, whoever it was, because they didn't show up close them performing CPR, so I don't know who uh, performed the CPR on the field last night, but those people saved his life. And so I would... um, Uh, They said the stadium had an AED and it was used for DeMar. A lot of companies have them now. Um, They're really easy to use because the machine actually tells you what to do, where to place the sensors, and then it monitors the heart and then tells you whether or not the machine believes that it needs to be activated to shock the heart or not. Um, These AEDs have become more and more affordable. A lot of companies already have them. And so I would just ask that if your company doesn't have one to see if it's something they could get and also ask, um, could we get a CPR instructor to come and teach basic life-saving skills uh, to us on company time? And um, I think that it's something that we should all have some kind of basic knowledge and understanding because weird things happen. This is like a one in a billion hit that he took to the chest at the exact right time. And um, it's scary. And the technology does exist. I sent out a tweet last night um, that, you know, um, Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest, he had a complete aortic dissection on stage, meaning that like the valve of his heart ripped off and he was bleeding to death. And just happened to be like eight miles away from one of the most renowned cardiac centers in the world, 10 and a half hours of surgery. They saved his life. He's back out on tour with the band. It's unbelievable what we can do, but 
you've got to be able to get to the medical experts. And if you can prolong that, I know there's so many veterans that um, learned these skills in the military. And, you know, there's so many veterans now that are part of the workforce that those skills are around us. But if you're able and willing to learn these skills, uh, I would implore you to seek out the opportunity. And if your company is not willing to do it, the Red Cross does these all the time. There's plenty of nonprofits. There's plenty of VFWs and American legions, um, plenty of organizations and groups that have these CPR classes. And sometimes they get canceled because there aren't enough people that want to take them. So just, um, just, please, if you have never taken a CPR course, uh, please do so. If you have in the past, I know I need to brush up on mine. Obviously the COVID lockdown, we weren't around a lot of other people a lot, um, but it's something we all need to take a little bit more seriously because, um, you know, the people that were able to bring Damar back last night and get him, get his vitals back to be able to be healthy enough to get in the ambulance and brought to the hospital where he could then receive the best care possible, which is why he's alive right now. It's a testament to people being readily available with the skill set and the equipment that they need. So uh, Heidi says, I learned when I was a lifeguard. Uh, Michael says, check with your local fire department. A A lot of cities and towns will hold these. A lot of libraries host these as well. Um, Donna says you should set up a war room one you know what? That's a really good idea, actually. I think that's a fantastic idea. And I will look into that 100% because this is something that, um, you know, growing up with a firefighter and a paramedic for a dad and an RN as a mom, it's just something that we just just always talked about. It was something that um, we were, we took um, CPR classes as kids because our parents encouraged it. So um, local rescue squad did that. Uh, Are you, uh, Jessica, are you saying that the local paramedics that they had on site that the NFL had hired are the ones that did the CPR? They, they're heroes, 100%. Um, Donna comes up with the best idea, says Heidi. Yeah, hold it off the rails. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to mention that. Somebody had asked if there was updates about Damar. Um, so thank you guys for reminding me because I did want to talk about that. All right. Some music stuff. I want to talk about that live Metallica concert from the, uh, within the all within my hands, uh, benefit show, uh, that is available for purchase streaming and downloading with the proceeds going to the all within my hands foundation. Speaking of streaming, congratulations to Metallica hitting a milestone in their career. Enter Sandman, the first Metallica song in the band's career that hit a billion streams on Spotify, which is huge. Congratulations to Billy Idol, who will receive his Hollywood Walk of Fame star on Thursday. Uh, Artist Shepard Ferry and uh, Henry Rollins are going to be keynote speakers at the dedication of Billy Idol's star, which is going to be placed in front of Amoeba Music on Hollywood Boulevard. And that's happening on Thursday. You'll be able to stream it live. I believe the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, who gives out the stars, is also going to stream the ceremony live online. A couple shows I want to remind you about that are coming up fast. Um, Alter Bridge and Mammoth WVH with Red are going to be at Roadrunner on February 8th. Theory of a Dead Man Skillet and Santa Sonia on the Rock Resurrection Tour will be at Roadrunner on February 25th. Tickets for both shows are available now. And if you have a Mistress Carrie backstage pass, there are going to be some tickets that are going to be available in the next couple of weeks, just waiting on a final count, which is why I didn't offer them up to you in the live stream the other night. Bush and Candlebox, speaking of February concerts, are going to be at the MGM Fenway on Valentine's Day. Tickets are on sale now. The new Godsmack album uh, due out on February 24th. Anthrax and Black Label Society will be at the House of Blues on February 5th. Uh, Something to look forward to as the weather gets colder and colder. Um, The final uh, farewell tour for Foreigner with Loverboy will be at the Xfinity Center coming up on August 5th. All of these shows are on sale and on the concert calendar. Aaron Lewis, the pre-New Stained album, is going to be at Foxwoods on April 22nd. 
Um, Stain, not the only band coming out with new music this year. Filter, coming out with a new album in 2023. Um, the new song, For the Beaten, is available now, and we're anticipating a massive tour announcement as well. The Dropkick Murphy shows are going to be in March. The MGM Music Hall at Fenway on March 17th and 18th. The House of Blues on the 19th. Speaking of St. Patrick's Day, Jerry Cantrell at the Cabot Theater which is why he's not playing with Bush and Candlebox because on other dates, Cantrell is playing with Bush and Candlebox, but Cantrell already has a solo date at the Cabot Theater booked in the area. So he's going to be in Beverly on March 17th. Blink-182's new album is coming out, the band reunited and playing the TD Garden on May 21st. Also want to remind you guys about um, Soulfly at the Brighton Music Hall on February 20th. Steel Panther at the Palladium on March 19th with Crowbot. Queensryche at the Palladium coming up April 7th. And did you guys catch the Black Keys performing during the first intermission at the Winter Classic at Fenway? And they performed accompanied by the Boston Pops. The video online is spectacular in case you weren't watching the game live or you weren't actually in attendance at Fenway. But pretty awesome that the Black Keys were in Boston playing at the Winter Classic and the weather, uh, great for the spectators and it looked like the condition of the ice was pretty good i was hoping that they weren't going to have a lot of problems because it was what 52 degrees in boston that day but they were able to hold the ice together for the game and obviously we all know that the bruins came back to beat the penguins uh, which is fantastic so all right let's talk about some mail call uh obviously we know this is the part of the show that wednesday wakes back up again she's just still over here snuggled on the pillow um everybody at the post office says happy new year by the way guys Uh, The first card we got, and I always love it when you guys send cards with dogs on them because I'm a sucker for cute dogs. Uh, Dear Mistress Carrie, wishing you uh, um, uh, Henry Crew uh, and family a Merry Christmas. I hope um, mom is doing okay. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. You rock with your purple hair from Jessica. It says, hoping your Christmas is blessed in every way. Thank you very much, Jessica. Also got this from a uh, girlfriend of mine named Maria. She's a record rep out in California. And I love it when people do this with their Christmas cards. She does a lot of work with animal rescue, specifically dog fostering and rescuing. These are her dogs, my friend Maria's dogs. I wanted to show this to you guys. Um, She put a dog butt on the back, which is kind of hilarious. Inside it says... um, my fiery little uh, ardent little Keegan definitely lived up to his Irish name, rescued by the Forgotten Dog Foundation on St. Patty's Day uh, in 2013 as a puppy. He went from my tiniest foster ever to just melting my heart and never uh, leaving. Keegan was pure joy, uh, intelligent, a comic, inquisitive, a social butterfly, nurturer, tough guy, guest greeter, snuggler, best tail wagger, my coworker. He stood tall, lit up a room, and had the biggest spirit and just made the day better. Uh, Quite the fan base, I might add. We lost my sweet soul on November 16th. How we loved him. She says, dearest Carrie, from our pack to yours, happiest of holidays. Here's to a kinder, gentler 2023. Much respect and love, lady. Peace, uh, light, and love. Love Jake, Lulu, and Keegan, too, uh, with each holiday card. A donation has been made to theforgottendog.org. And um, those are her dogs. And that's a picture of Maria as well. And I love it when people do charitable donations with their holiday cards as well. I just think it's super classy and sweet. And um, so I wanted to thank Maria for her card as well. I got this. Came in the mail. It came from Just Love Skulls. And it came to Carrie and MCHQ, but it didn't have a card or anything inside. But this t-shirt came in, which is now like my new favorite Christmas shirt. Check this out. How cool is this shirt? So I don't know who sent it. But I love it, and it has now become my favorite Christmas shirt. So I will be wearing this next holiday season with pride. Thank you so much to whoever sent it. Um, Thank you for thinking of me. It's badass. It's so cool. 
and it's from Just Love Skulls, which is a website I'd never heard of before. And now I'm definitely going to go and check it out because I love skulls. All right. This one says Christmas wishes. It says this box is all for Wednesday and zero. Carrie, family, Wednesday and zero, best wishes for a special Christmas and new year filled with happiness. Wishing you and your family a very Merry Christmas and a great new year. Love, Melissa and Tim McMahon. Thanks, guys. And when she says this is all for Wednesday and zero, she's not kidding. So I want to show you some of the amazing stuff. Wednesday just poked her head up, of course, because she's got new crinkles. Is that a sloth? It is. Look at the sloth. And is this, I, I think a mouse and a sloth dressed in Christmas clothes. I don't know where you guys find these. Um, there's also a little bit bigger of a crinkle. You guys know how much Wednesday loves these crinkle toys. By the way, hold on. Look who's awake, everyone. Back up, and I'll give you all your prizes. Uh, there's also a Santa Kringle in here and a Pug Kringle. I, I don't know where you guys keep finding these, but when I tell you she plays with every single one, somebody sent her a long time ago a giant like coffee mug that had stuffed and squeaking donuts inside. The donuts have all been eaten, but the mug has all these holes in it, and it's an interactive toy where you put a, the donuts would go inside the dogs would pull it out. I stuffed the mug with all the little crinkle toys, like 10 or 12 of them in there. And it's one of her favorite things in the world. I'll throw it across the room and she will spend like 10 minutes pulling all of the crinkle toys out. And then she'll look at me and be like, well, are you going to stuff them back in there so that I can pull them back out again? Um, guys, look at this. It's got this tug rope on it, but it's a squeaky hug. And when I tell you that Wednesday and Zero play tug of war all the time, Zero lets Wednesday win because we all know that she wouldn't otherwise. Um, I also love the little mug of hot chocolate. And the doghouse mix, the little squeaky cassette. See, I don't know where you guys find the stuff. And speaking of the little um, interactive toys, there are all these little snowballs. You know what else she loves too that somebody sent her recently is the milk pugs, which are all the little pug heads that get stuffed inside the little box of candy. She loves them. And that's what's going to happen with these. These are going to get stuffed in that big giant coffee mug and she is going to go nuts over them. Wednesday, do you want to eat one of these? She's so excited right now. You got to back up. Back up. You want this? You want this? Do you want all of them? Uh, hold on. Do you want me to, do you want me to give you a crinkle instead? I want to give you the sloth crinkle because it's so damn cute. Is that what you want? Can we get all the plastic pieces out of it? Here. I don't know what it is about these crinkle toys, guys. I really, I, I don't know what it is. But she loves them. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you want this? <laughs> oh, the crinkle toys. So thank you guys for spoiling the dogs. Every time somebody comes in the house and sees the big giant basket of dog toys, they're like, oh my God, you spoil your dog. And I'm like, no, I didn't get those for her. She's spoiled by the War Room family. And then the other box that came in 
came in to spoil me. And this one came from Ralph. Ralph sent me a Christmas box of Pez, which is insane. Everything from Christmas reindeer. I know I don't have this one. The Nutcracker. Polar bears. I also know I don't have the gingerbread man. There's another nutcracker here. Uh, Santa and a snowman. And they change these up all the time. So I have Santa and snowman, but I probably don't have the newest ones. I also know I don't have this elf. I don't know how, Ralph. I know I don't have this snowman for sure. So I believe that's a newer one. And then Star Wars, The Mandalorian. Guys, look at these. The Marvel sets. Oh, snap. The Black Panther set. How cool is this? And then also, and I know I don't have this one, and I know I don't have this one. Ralph, you rule. So many new additions to my Pez dispenser collection. And I really do need to take an updated photo of the collection. Uh, when the kids were here, they went downstairs and they were like, are you kidding? How many do you have now? And I was like, I don't know. It's like four or 500 of them in, there, in that case now. Um, so thank you, Ralph. It's like, I can't tell you which ones I don't have. But when I see one, I can tell you if I have it or not. And I know a bunch of those I don't have already. And also, just so you guys know, the ones that I have that are duplicates, I always leave them in the package. And um, then anytime um, either people come over to visit that have kids or come over here Wednesday or uh, anytime I get invited to go and do some kind of event or whatever with kids, I always bring um, all of these Pez dispensers with me. Um, and kids get so excited when you, I mean, look at me, like I'm a full blown adult and I get excited when you give me Pez, but little kids get so excited when you give them Pez. So just know that if you guys ever send me Pez that I already have, they're not going to waste because they're going to make a little kid smile somewhere. And, um, so yeah, uh, Keith wants to know if there's any I'm looking for. N not really. It's like, I, I love them all equally right? It's like, if I don't have them, I want them. I don't collect certain kinds. Um, they're always coming out with new ones, especially, um, you know, just since emojis have become a thing. I have the poop emoji one and some of the other, like, you know, emoji heads and stuff. Um, I also have a lot of like Pez matchbox cars and kind of Pez other things besides Pez dispensers. So what, do you want me to pet you? Is that what you want? You're scratching me because I'm not touching you. Would you like me to rub you? Is that what you want? So no, there aren't any that I'm specifically looking for, but um, I got, uh, Mark says, I got a Back to the Future Funko Pop. By the way, the Jonathan Davis Funko that I got last week uh, looks fantastic in MCHQ with all of the rest of them. The Funkos, I only collect the band ones. Um just because there's so many of them. One of the things we did with the kids while we were here, we spent the day, oh, that was one of the things I want to tell you about. We spent the day in Boston and we went to uh, Newbury Comics and we, especially the one at Faneuil Hall, which is huge. Um, I mean, we spent like an hour just looking at the Funko Pops. There are just so many of them now. One of the things that I wanted to show you guys, Wednesday, can you look out please? Because I need to. One of the things that I wanted to tell you guys about um, is this art installation that is on Newbury Street. It's down at the end of Newbury by Mass Ave, down by the original Newbury Comics location, which is what made me think of it. And uh, my sister um, got me and my husband and the kids tickets to go to this um, art exhibit called The Art of the Brick. Uh, I put some pictures of it up on Instagram and um, I wanted to share some of the pictures uh, with you. Hey, 
Stop scratching. You'll get the rest of the toy. Do you want another toy? Is that what you want? How about the mouse? Do you want the mouse? Hold on. Let me break the plastic off because I know you, and you'll eat the plastic. Back up. You want this one? She's over here scratching because she knows there's a box of toys that she doesn't have access to readily because the box of Pez is in the way. She's like, that whole box is for me, Mom. You know that, right? <sighs> so anyway, um, thank you. Here. So we went to this exhibit called The Art of the Brick. And hold on, I want to bring up... Um, Um, a thing so that um, I can put some pictures on the screen for you guys and show you. Because if you've got kids um, and you're looking for something to do, especially during the winter, I don't know how long this exhibit is going to be there. It's not a permanent installation. But this thing is called the art of the brick. And basically this artist makes things out of um, Legos and it's spectacular. The art that this guy does, um, hold on. I'm bringing up some of the ones so that I can show them to you. I knew there was something else I wanted to talk to you guys about. Sorry that the show's running so late, but I really wanted you guys to, um, be able to go and see this. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. This is probably one of the most famous images of the art that he does with Legos. And um, he does Lego sculpture, huge life-size Lego sculpture. And they use thousands of Legos. Um, the kids and I were looking to see which one of the sculptures used the most bricks um, and there are several. So I wanted to show you some of the ones. This is bigger than life size. So this is probably five feet by five feet across and down. This used, I think, like 21,000 Legos. Um, so cool. All of these exhibits are 3D. So you kind of walk around them. You can get right up close to them. I love this one, obviously, because it was purple. Um, but these exhibits go around the country and you can go and, uh, see them. They're super kid friendly. Uh, it's over three floors at this gallery, uh, on Newbury street. This is one of the most unbelievable ones guys. This thing is massive. It's like 12 or 14 feet long and it's like seven feet tall and it's a full T-Rex made out of, I think they said it was like 25,000 Legos or something like that. It's spectacular. Um, I was talking to some of the people that curate it and they said that it arrived in crates. A lot of these bricks obviously get glued together so that they can survive transport. One of the other interesting things that he does, I wanted to show you this one, is that there's some of them that are actually interactive that you can sit. And I thought this was really cool. It's in front of a backdrop of the Boston skyline and you can sit on this park bench and stare at this thing. And it's, it's a, a full human size Lego sculpture, which was really, really cool. Then, uh, there's a set of Lego wings that the kids and my husband were laughing at the concept of me having angel wings, but those are affixed to the wall. So you can go up and take pictures in front of them um, which a lot of people were doing, which is really, really cool. And then I wanted to show you some of these. He also does some portraiture. This is a giant wall portrait of Andy Warhol. The further away from this thing you get, the less you see the bricks. It's unbelievable. So there was that one on the wall. There's a whole section of fine art. P.S. There's like full-size sculptures of like the thinker and David, like massive sculptures. He did this portrait of his partner. 
So this is, I don't know if it's his wife or his girlfriend, but this is his life partner and it's her photograph. And I don't know why, but this was one of my favorite ones. This thing is huge. It's like five feet across and it's up on the wall and you'll see the little white card next to it that kind of gives you information about whatever piece was in it uh, that I loved. And then this was one of my favorites. Then he took fine works of art and you can see down on the white card next to it, the print, the name of the print and all the details of the original masterpiece. And then he redoes them in Legos. And I'm telling you, the further away you get from these, the more they look like paintings and the less they look like Legos. Until you get right up to it, you don't even realize they're Lego bricks. And it is so cool. Uh, here's another example. And what's crazy is that I actually have a print of this in my house, um, which is just one of my favorites. I love it. Um, but he made it out of Legos and you can compare it to the original. And like I said, the further away that you get from it, the more it looks like the original. And I don't know how one finds the patience to do this. This was another one of my favorites because again, the further away from it you got, the less it looked like Legos. It's so cool. Um, and it's in Boston. It's called The Art of the Brick. And if you want to go and check it out, it's a great exhibit to bring kids. But there were a lot of adults that just went because it's just that cool. And then at the end, they have all of these bins of Legos and um, you can um, uh, interact with them. And there was one other one that I wanted to show you because this is the one out of all of the exhibits that used the most Legos. And it's the only one that you're like encouraged to touch. Um, so let me find it here. Here it is. This one I loved. We took a family photo like this. Everything in this photo besides the neon is made out of Legos. Look at the, the Lego skull, the Lego cello, the peace sign, the ampersand, the stars on the wall. The chair that I'm sitting in is all made out of Legos. And the heart that I'm holding is solid. The thing must weigh 20 pounds and it's all Legos. And you're actually encouraged to go and sit in the chair. You wait in line and you can take photos of it. And um, that's his phrase, art is not optional. And he's Hey, get down. Come on, get down. And one of the things, there's a little welcome video, and one of the things he encourages people to do is just to make art in however it makes you happy, but make art. And he was a lawyer that quit his lawyer job and started making art out of Legos. And it's so cool. Um, artist is so amazing. Wow, very cool. Sounds neat. Um, yeah. So if you guys haven't checked this out yet, he's got multiple exhibits that tour around the United States. So you can just look up the art of the brick and you can find what cities they're in. And I totally encourage you to go and see it because I loved it so much. So um, they won't let you hold the skull. I asked. The only one that you can hold is the hearts. They actually hand that one to you. Everything else is staged exactly the way that the artist wants it. And, um, so we took a family photo. Then my husband and I took a photo of just the two of us. The kids took their own photos with the heart. Um, so yeah, go and check it out. Uh, all right. So we got to finish up the show. Wanted to remind you guys, Mistress Carrie merch available at Joe's albums. If you've got some money and some gift certificates that you want to spend and you're looking for some music, especially if you're going to be going to shows at the Palladium or at the DCU center, Joe's albums is right on Main Street, right around the corner. So get into Worcester a little early. Go do some shopping at Joe's Albums. Go grab a bite to eat. If you're celebrating your birthday tonight or today, you share your birthday with John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin, Stephen, uh, Stephen Stills, and also George Martin, speaking of the Beatles and Abbey Road Studios, uh, known as the fifth Beatle, George Martin, also born on this date. So happy birthday if today's your birthday. Happy unbirthday, Keith. Cheers to you guys. Ah, 
so good. Um, and then, uh, once again, want to tell everybody, obviously the mistress Carrie backstage passes on Patreon. We, um, met last night and we set a date for the next live stream that we're going to do for backstage pass members only. It's coming up Sunday, January 29th at seven o'clock. And, uh, one of the many things that we do, if you get a backstage pass is we do a monthly live stream. You also get notified who's going to be on the podcast ahead of time so that you can submit podcast interview questions. When I travel, you get the travel blog updates, early access to event tickets and event info. And um, you also uh, get access to exclusive concert ticket giveaways. And there's some of those coming in the coming weeks. So if you don't have a backstage pass yet, you can get it at patreon.com slash mistress Carrie, or just click the Patreon link at mistresscarry.com. And here is all of the social media links. They're all linked on the website. If you're looking for me, pretty easy to find. Uh, so that's it. All right, guys, I apologize that the show ran late, but I really wanted to tell you about the Lego thing that we went to because the whole family loved it so much. And my sister gave it to us as a Christmas gift. And, um, it was a badass Christmas gift. We had a really, really good time. So, uh, that was it. So don't forget episode uh, 135 of the Mistress Carrie podcast goes live at midnight tonight featuring podcast host and author of the new book, Pink Floyd and the Dark Side of the Moon, 50 Years. Martin Popoff is my guest on the podcast this week, and that goes live at midnight. All right, guys, I'll see you guys next week. Have a great week, everybody. Sorry that you had to go back to work this week. And uh, good night. You ready to go? play with toys Wednesday. Let's go. Let's go unpack the rest of your toys. Are you ready? Good night, guys.